Uh, here we have Jim Chatfield. He's coming to us to do part two of a wonderful presentation that he started last month. And he's actually gonna look at a little bit more about invasive species as well. So Jim, when you get ready, you can either start your dialogue or share your screen, but the floor okay. is yours. All right, great. So Diana gave me the idea for the way I wanna change over. So I had a program that I had for the two segments of this bad plant thing. The, and I had that all planned out. And we did a, a, some of it last time and I was gonna do more of it. But she mentioned earlier uh, that, that, that first night that she had assumed I was going to speak about invasive plants. And I actually had not planned to do that. That was probably a little bit because I'd just done a program on that for another group. But I, she was right. I think that when people hear a talk described as bad plants, they, they, that's going to be one of the things that they, uh, that, that they would be thinking about was invasive species. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll do it. But of course, I won't do exactly what she wants because I'm incapable of doing exactly what anybody wants and not even knowing what it is that I want. So I'm gonna do it on invasive species. So I'm gonna broaden it out from just plants and it will have a hard core of plants, but I also insects and, and pathogens and stuff. So a little talk about that in a little bit broader sense, but uh, it'll, it'll focus a lot on plants. And then if we get to the other stuff at some point, we'll do that too. Before I start though, I wanna hold up a book that I just, somebody sent me to this upon my retirement. Uh, a crack in creation, and uh, it's it's a 2017 book by Jennifer Doudna, and Jennifer Doudna is uh, this. She won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020, and she won it for CRISPR. So she is the one that really did the the fundamental uh, research um, on how we can edit genes, and of course, we are all very thankful to. <laughs> Jennifer Doudna, because what her work was really began with, and obviously there've been various permutations, but what her work really began with was figuring out, was understanding and how we understand now about gene editing the way that we do was understanding how bacteria deal with viruses. So, you know, viruses that, that uh, infect bacteria are called, uh, are called phages or phages. So they're literally, the, the idea is they're eating bacteria. That's not quite right, or quite right, right. But, but we call them bacteriophages because they are viruses that attack bacteria. So in the evolutionary picture, uh, bacteria have, you know, all organisms are figuring out how to, to, uh, to do various things to, to deal with other organisms that they're interacting with, although viruses are not considered organisms. But the way that bacteria edit their, their uh, you know, edit the, uh, their genome to, uh, in an evolutionary sense over time, to prevent these, these bacteriophages from wiping out the bacterium uh, was by taking out chunks of DNA. Anyway, learning how that worked is what has now allowed us today to figure out how to create vaccines. So in addition to all the other many, many effects that can occur, and this isn't about transgenic plants, it's kind of, or transgenic organisms, it's more, it's more a matter of figuring out how to edit uh, in the own genome of that organism, how, and you know, obviously with the dangers, and she talks all about that, but how to edit your own genome. So, so in figuring out how bacteria do that, we have figured out how, I mean, the reason that, you know, if you'll recall back last, well, a year ago, when the discussions began about, are we going to have vaccines? How long will it take to get vaccines? And, and people started to talk about, well, you know, vaccine is a really iffy proposition. I mean, boy, vaccines, uh, in some cases, we still don't have vaccines for many uh, serious diseases of humans. Uh, we've been working on it for decades. But, you know, if you do develop a vaccine, you know, it might be 10 years, it might be five years. Well, then people started to talk about, well, you know, we think we really can develop these vaccines much more quickly. The reason we were develop, able to develop vaccines this fast was because we use CRISPR technology. We, we use this, the uh, technology that uh, was developed by Jennifer Doudna and other people uh, at basically based on the idea of figuring out how it was that bacteria fought off their own viruses. And so uh, we owe a great deal, uh, but anyway, I started reading the book and I wanted to, to begin tonight's program with a quote that she uses at the beginning, not her quote. It's from Ralph Waldo 
Emerson. And it's a great, simple sentence. Science does not know its debt to imagination. Science does not know its debt to imagination. And so, you know, that's, uh, that's a good way to think of science. You know, how do bacteria deal with bacteriophages? Who cares? What, who, who thinks about that? What could that mean? Well, it means a lot. And we know exactly the potential for what it means relative to human diseases as we're dealing with COVID. All right, with that, I will share my screen and we will launch into the pervasiveness of invasiveness. Let's see. Can everybody see this? Can everybody see the screen? Are you there? Hello, hello. Is there anybody out there? Hello, hello, yeah. hello. Yes, yes, I, can, can yes I can hear. I can see it. We can okay, see just, the screen. Invasives when worlds collide. Come all right, mm -hmm. excellent. That's what, I, that's what I wanted. I just wanted to know that that was really happening. All right, yes. so up here yes. in the left-hand corner, as we look here, this may be my hand. What is this plant that I'm showing the stem of? That's a plant? That is the, the bud. So those are the, that is the leaf scar of an invasive plant. So that's where the leaf is attached. This, the leaves are actually, the leaves are compound leaves and the leaves of this plant, I should show you, I'm gonna put the, the leaves are way, the leaf, the, an individual leaf of this plant may be three and a half, four feet long, uh, uh, usually not quite four feet. And it's a compound leaf, which means that there's an axillary bud here. There's the axillary bud. And then coming off of that is one leaf that has lots and lots of little leaflets. This is a invasive tree species with a rather pleasant sort of common name. Tree of paradise. Very, very close. Tree of heaven. Tree so of the tree, heaven. Of, uh, tree, of, tree heaven. of heaven, Ilanthus, is a significant invasive plant that we are uh, concerned about in our forest. And, it, and it's a tree that can grow kind of anywhere. So we'll come and talk about that. Now, since we're talking about invasive species, anybody, I, any idea what this little invasive species is? Cockroach? Not a cockroach. It has, what, what color is this? Green. Ashmore. Emerald. Is there yes an ash emerald ash an ash emerald ash borer so an emerald, emerald ash, ash borer you're right Chris and one of the reasons uh, uh, that I've included it here is it it uh, it it, uh, it tells us a very interesting story and the or, the interesting story is really about when worlds collide and this story is told over and over and over again when we're dealing with invasive plants when we're dealing with insects invasive plant pathogens. And that is that when we oftentimes have an explosion of a major problem is when a organism uh, moves from one portion of the world to another, when worlds collide. So for example, if we think of, of, of a lot of the major killer types of, of pests and pathogens that infect plants, as an example, of course, this is also true of animals and humans that are animals, uh, as, as we can imagine. But when we think of plants, you think about uh, organisms that really have created massive problems. And typically, one of the things that are not typically, but frequently, especially if they're major killers, the issue becomes that if there's no natural selection, there is no adequate level of resistance, genetic resistance. And so what that means for this story is that you have emerald ash borer, which comes from Asia. And so in Asia, the emerald ash borer, which has been there for millions and millions and millions of years, is not a particularly significant pest. It's a bark, it's, it's basically a bark beetle. And it's not really a major pest in Asia. And the reason it's not a major pest in Asia on ashes, the genus Fraxinus, is that it's native to that area and it's been around there for millions of years. And ultimately over time, uh, you know, it's not really a matter of familiarity breeds contempt, it's familiarity breeds familiarity. 
And the fact of the matter is that in, in Asia, the organism, the ash trees that are, that are Asian have adapted to it over time by developing all kinds of phytochemicals. Uh, so, you know, with, you know, random mutations and natural selection, eventually the, the ashes that, are, that exist there, the Asian ashes, have genetic resistance because the survivors kept having some of the advantage relative to dealing with this pest. And over, you know, over long, long, long periods of time, ultimately it becomes a secondary pest. And when I say secondary pest, most bark beetles, when we talk about them, they're secondary. They are, they are attacking a plant that's already dead or dying, or in many cases dying, but not dead. So they're really not seen as a major problem because something else has already been the precipitating event, drought, uh, competition, damage from other sources of uh, damage from other problems. And so then it finishes them off. Well, that all changes when you introduce it to a to germplasm, in other words, fraxinous species, ash species that are not from Asia, that are in North American, for example. So our North American ashes, the white ash, the green ash, the black ash, the pumpkin ash, the blue ash, those ashes are North American uh, species. I mean, obviously at one time they're, they were related and you know, we had land bridges and continents that were connected and all that kind of stuff. But ultimately they've been separated for so long that their genetics are different. They have never faced the, the threat from this bark beetle. And so instead of it being just kind of an irritant that finishes plants off if they're already stressed, it will attack healthy plants. That's a real story with invasive species. That's really a big component of the when worlds collide aspects. You are introduced to a new ecosystem. You're introduced to new germplasm, which has not experienced your presence before. And so with emerald ash borer, it's our native ashes that are <coughs> threatened. Bronze birch borer, which is an insect that looks very much like the emerald ash borer, but it does not get on ashes, it gets on birches, and, uh, <clears throat> and it's not emerald. Uh, the bronze birch borer, which is closely related, actually in the same genus, the emerald ash borer, agrilus, but it's, it's uh, a different specific organism. Its host range is only on birches. That happens to be a native insect. So the, the uh, bronze birch borer is a native insect. And guess which plants that it affects? It affects our non-native birches. So uh, if you bring European and Asian birches, plant them in the United States, the plant, they are the plants that are damaged by bronze birch borer because it's a native insect and our native birches are not as very susceptible to it. So, you know, that when worlds collide thing is a very important issue associated with all the things that we talk about invasiveness. It can be specific phytochemicals that fight off pests that develop through natural selection, or it can be simply an ecosystem response to a new organism that is then suddenly introduced and, and uh, we have a different situation. Uh, down here, we have a pathogen that's like that. There, this, this pathogen that caused this problem on potatoes is a Phytophthora infestans, which is an oomycete organism, used to be called a fungus. And it led to late blight of potato. So that's an invasive species that caused late blight of potato and the Irish potato famine, along with a lot of political issues and all that sort of stuff. And the same sort of thing. The Phytophthora infestans organism originated in the place where potatoes originated. And so you're talking about South America uh, in Peru, Peruvian areas. And so, you know, obviously we moved potatoes to the new, the, to the old world. We moved uh, potatoes from the new world uh, with some of our explorers. They took it back to, uh, to Europe. Of course, then potatoes almost transformed culture in a lot of different ways. Very important plants that people could easily feed themselves with. Uh, and, and so that spread throughout, uh, you know, throughout Europe and, and obviously into Ireland and those sorts of things. But this pathogen that came from Peru also eventually showed up in that potato crop. And then they had that when worlds collide when this Peruvian pathogen was occurring on this Peruvian plant that we had now moved to Europe. And so you can see how all those things kind of link up together. I'm showing you this picture. Does anybody know what this plant is here with my, my pointer? Nasturtium. Oh. What is it? Nasturtium. No, it is not, but that's good. The color is like nasturtium. Yeah, the this back is, with the little thing is. is yeah, it, well, this, this is a woodland, uh, a woodland plant. Is it jewelweed? 
It is jewel weed. Jewel weed. So uh, nasturtium, nasturtium really does have that same look, but this is jewel weed, and this is a, a, a native. So jewel weed is in the genus Impatiens. And if you ever say, oh, what do you mean jewel weeds in the genus Impatiens? Well, remember, a genus is a group of related species, related, related things. And so if you, <clears throat> if you ever wonder if it makes much, if you can kind of remember that the jewel weed is in the, ge the genus Impatiens, you know, if you have impatience in your yard, especially not the New Guinea impatience, but the uh, the more bedding plant impatience, you'll, you'll you'll notice that they really wilt in the sun. And if you notice jewelweed in the woods, they do the same thing. So they're in the genus impatience. There's a bunch of different species. Impatience pallida is a yellow version, another species of impatience that we have in our woods. So that's a native impatience. This is a Himalayan jewelweed. And so this has become a major invasive in certain parts of the world. And I have a story to tell, which is pretty interesting here. And because it relates to our desire for new things and pretty things and, uh, and not knowing, for, certainly in my case, not understanding what this was, thinking it was so beautiful and then realizing that it can be an invasive uh, plant for many people. This is uh, a little poem we're going we're gonna to review here about the sparrow. And we'll talk about that later. And then in this corner, this is a, a really... It's a wonderful story. I think that invasive species are one of the most fascinating things to talk about for anybody that's interested in biology, interested in plants. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a really long story that we're going to tell ultimately about Pyrus clariana. So Pyrus clariana is the calorie pear. It is a species of pear that is not native to the U.S. It's a species of pear that became the darling of the ornamental industry. It's a species of pear that uh, has become uh, a big invasive that you're seeing right now. If you go along interstates, all those white flowering trees, and you say, boy, how did people plant those? Well, they didn't. The angry birds planted those, uh, those, uh, those white flowering trees right now, which are calorie pears. And so we have a, quite a story to tell about that when worlds collide. And so that's why it's on the, the cover here. So we're going to talk about all this kind of stuff uh tonight and anything else you want to talk about and maybe we won't talk about any of this at all because you decide that you're going to ask questions and we won't get there at any rate this is now past but this uh this relates to my one of my favorite poems first the howling winds awoke us then the rains came down to soak us now before the mind can focus crocus i always thought that lilia rogers poem is so fun of course that's all past now and crocus have moved past the scene all right and then, of course, I always have to bring in plant pathogens a little bit. And so, and, and again, my, my, the point I'm really making here, and I include this, and I included this in one of our earlier talks, is just the wonder of, the wonder of nature, the diversity of nature, the always learning new things about nature. So cedar apple rust, for example, is a fungus that goes back and forth between junipers, eastern red cedars, so they're not true cedars, they're eastern red cedars, and, uh, but not cedrus, they're not true cedars like cedar of Lebanon would be. <clears throat> At any rate, in another, uh, I don't know, three weeks, we're going to have this fungus that is causing these galls, these abnormal growths that are caused by the fungus and end up being half fungus, half uh, plant tissue on the juniper, will produce a bunch of spore horns that will spread microscopic spores that will infect a plant in the rose family. So everything from a juniper all the way to a plant in the rose family, like an apple or a crab apple or a hawthorn. And then the fungus mates inside the leaf here and comes out the bottom and it produces spores and it goes back to the, the juniper. And so, that, uh, that, so this rust fungi with alternate hosts going back and forth, it's fascinating. And there's a reason I'm telling that story. We also have cedar quince rust that doesn't cause those big galls. So that's a different species. Uh, this uh, fungus is called gymnosporangium. Gymnosporangium produces spores on gym, a gymnosperm in the, in the case of uh, the juniper. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so gymnosporum juniperi virginiani, because it's occurring on, on juniperus virginiani, but here it's having that cycle. This is a different one. It's a different species of gym, uh, gymnosporangium, juniper, uh, gymnosporangium clavipes. It causes cedar quince rust. But it causes cedar quince rust on other members of the of the rose family, such as quince, but also on crab apples and apples and hawthorns as well. And what it looks like on those plants is more on the fruits. You may have seen this. So, 
So usually when we, we talk about cedar rust, we talk about cedar apple rust, we talk about cedar hawthorn rust, we talk about cedar quince rust, uh, even though I've known for many years as a plant pathologist, there are some other ones. Those are the three that we usually talk about. We then saw that we noticed a gymnosporangium, that's not spelled right, G-Y-M-N-O, gymnosporangium sabini. We started to notice that this calorie pear was starting to develop pear trellis rust. So there are all these other gymnosporangium species that cause these diseases as well, going back and forth between junipers and plants in the rose family. There's pear trellis rust can be quite spectacular. These pictures were from uh, German village where I took these pictures when I first saw this in Ohio. <clears throat> and so there's all these cedar rust, cedar apple rust, cedar hawthorn rust, cedar quince rust. Then we became aware of pear trellis rust. And now, at least in Ohio, Asian red rust. We just published a paper. Uh, Francesca Peduto Hand is the ornamental plant pathologist at Ohio State University. And her, uh, what had happened is that uh, I had gone to, uh, we, we had had a, an occurrence, and this is about an invasive species. We had an occurrence at our crab apple plots at Worcester. We have a big crab apple uh, garden and crab apple plot in Worcester. Uh, it's you know, one of the key uh, plots of the International Ornamental Crab Apple Society. And we just had 75 scientists this morning in a really wonderful Zoom uh, with uh, the Nanjing Forestry in, uh, University and the Beijing Botanic Garden and us. We would have been there, except we couldn't go there this year uh, for this crab apple symposium. And we, and we talked about all this. And so, you know, we, so this is, you know, this is really an interesting thing. So anyway, I, uh, we had this occurrence at, at our crab apple plot in Worcester at the research station for Ohio State University. And the thing was that I was always a little puzzled by why we didn't see more cedar apple rust and cedar hawthorn rust and cedar quince rust on our crab apples. We have you know, 76 different crab apples in a randomized replicated plot at the Arboretum. We would see it only on three or four hooks. Okay, um, chat. I look froze here. Unmute, Jim, unmute. You're muted. What the His Wi Fi might have froze up. Okay. But he should be able to come back in just a minute. I tell you, technology is wonderful until it doesn't work. I know. Ugh. Second night of Judas, that was what happened. Ugh, did not work. Oh, well. Right in the middle of crab apple rust. I know. This I'm is sitting the at the edge of my seat wondering what the answer is. Come on, Jim. We'll come back on in a few minutes. He's probably had to go down and come back on again. So usually it's supposed to pick it right back up, but um, you know, I know he's down in the Wooster area, or actually in Doylestown. I understand, Diane, you was able to get outside and do some things in your yard? Oh, uh, I, I, dirt. That's what I did. I put down dirt and compost, dirt and compost. Dirt and That's comp all. Okay. Did anybody else get a chance to get outside today? Chris? Of course. Of course. Of course. I planted some potatoes. My pea shoots are up about four inches now. Um, we had fresh chives on our hash brown potatoes this morning for breakfast. So we're moving right along. Great. You all packed and ready to go for tomorrow? No. We we had to see Jim on this Zoom tonight. Okay. So okay. That's, it'll... that's good. That's good. Hey Jim, you okay? Back so, in? so I uh, I got, I got no I got knocked off for some reason, but I think I'm back. Good. Uh, all right. So uh, I, I'm assuming that we were about right here. Yes. Uh, so okay. So we went from three of our. 
three out of 76, let's say, in a given year that we'd have rust to all but two or three that didn't have rust in 2019. So it, it just so, ha- and, and also I noticed something different. I noticed that we had what we call lipstick rust. It was much redder. It was more red than orange on our crab apples. And so I was really puzzled by it. We had all kinds of different ideas and theories about what was going on. So at any rate, I was happened to be visiting my uh, grand's son in New York City, and I decided to drive out onto Long Island uh, to an extension and research center uh, on Long Island, almost all the way to the tip, almost to Montauk. And uh, Marjorie Daughtry is a, an incredible ornamental plant pathologist out there. And so I went to spend a day with her walking around, looking at stuff, beech leaf disease we were very interested in, which had just shown up on Long Island after we originally had only seen it in Ohio. And so uh, I said, you yeah, know, we're seeing, we're seeing this weird, what's going on with the rust? And she said, well, Jim, what about Gymnosporangium yamadai? And I said, what? Gymnosporangium yamadai? I did not know about this species of rust fungus. It turns out that Marjorie did know about it. And the only, there were only two reports ever in the United States of this rust fungus. And one of them was in 2009, and it was found on uh, a, a crab apple in the, uh, crab apples in, in Delaware and Pennsylvania. 2010, somebody found it on Juniperus chinensis, a type of juniper in, uh, uh, in that area of the, the state. And so uh, I said, well, I don't know. And so anyway, uh, 2019, uh, the season moved on. And then finally this summer, 2020, I decided to collect a bunch of them. And in my one visit to Columbus, uh, you know, obviously we were in the COVID this summer, my one visit to Columbus, I took down a bunch of samples to Francesca Peduta hand, and she got her, her graduate students to do a DNA analysis. And we discovered that we now have this invasive species, only the second time it's been found in North America. So we just published a paper on it. But Gymnosporangium yamadai, uh, which turns out was <clears throat> uh, first uh, described by Yamada in, in 1904, but it all, you know, pretty much been just something that they saw in Korea, Japan, and China, and was all as well, uh, it, it becoming a major issue on apples, in addition to the highly revered crab apples that really are a very revered plant in China. Uh, since uh, it also has been found in Russia, and there now is an occurrence in Canada, but we have it in Ohio, and that's what's happened is that basically of the seven, 76 crab apples that had, would get rust before, what we had now was a new rust fungus that uh, these plants were susceptible to. They apparently had developed resistance to the other, uh, for example, our native rust fungus, Gymnosporangium juniperi virginiani, that occurs on, on the Virginia juniper. So at any rate, that's just an example of how this keeps coming up. So this is potentially a major issue associated with apples and crab apples in the United States now that we've found this. So we'll see how that goes. We're gonna do a lot of survey work this summer, especially since so we can move around. So I don't know, I guess I'm retired, but I will be doing a lot of that with both junipers and crab apples to see what's going on with this new species because it changed in a hurry. We really don't know how long it's been in Ohio, but we certainly, I don't think had it at Secret Star Breedum. Suddenly, boom, it went from very few of our crab apples in our plot to virtually all of the crab apples in our plot. So something has happened. Uh, the host plant hasn't changed. We have a new pathogen. So invasive species always become issues. Hey, Jim, I did a talk. I think, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Could you put it in presentation mode? Oh, I am sorry. You got to remind me of these things. No problem. Now, I may have mentioned, I think I mentioned this last time, but I thought I'd just bring it up again of how invasive species are, are things that we're constantly talking about. And last time we talked about plants that are plant pathogens. So, you know, we obviously typically talk about microscopic organisms like plant parasitic nematodes, like certain fungi, certain oomycetes, like that Phytophthora infestans that caused the late blight of potato like bacteria, we're always talking about these microscopic organisms that cause infections, infectious plant diseases, but there is a macroscopic organisms that cause infectious plant diseases. And some of those are what we would call uh, plant, plant pathogens, which would be mistletoes and and dodder, cuscata, dodder, and all that sort of stuff. So at any rate, uh, it was just neat when I was researching that program and uh, 
the fact that Luther Burbank, uh, in addition to all the other things that he did, uh, introducing eucalyptus to California, which people aren't too thrilled about either, but he spread the European true mistletoe to the U.S., joining our native foradendron. So we have a native uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, mistletoe that occurs in the U.S. and is the one that occurs in Ohio, but also the European mistletoe that have been seen as a plant pathogen for many, many years, for many centuries, uh, was not in the U.S., but Luther introduced it, as we oftentimes do, not realizing that it then became kind of a, a significant pest out of the West. So, uh, and spread around by, by birds. All right. And then again, in, if we're talking about invasive species, I mean, we can't ignore the, uh, the elephant virus in the, in, in the view screen. Uh, our human coronavirus pathogens and diseases uh, for uh, we have these coronaviruses. Uh, four, it's interesting with coronaviruses. Four, there are four coronaviruses that are actually cause common colds. So uh, not all not all of our common colds are caused by coronaviruses or caused by other viruses. But four uh, coronavirus, different specific genetic uh, coronaviruses, are are common cold viruses. There uh, is uh, SARS uh, uh, CoV and you'll, you'll notice these things. So SARS-CoV is the virus that causes SARS, so severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is uh, you know, one of these coronaviruses where we have fundamentally dodged the bullet on relative to it becoming a real pandemic. MERS-CoV was a coronavirus, and by corona, we're talking about these little nice protein projections on, uh, uh, on the outside of the virus particle, which is... Uh, uh, nucleic acid and then RNA in this case, and then on there are the protein spikes. And MERS, again, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that came along here uh, not too many years ago. Again, we more or less dodged the bullet relative to it becoming a global pandemic of concern. And then our novel SARS-CoV-2 virus, the pathogen, uh, which causes COVID-19. So the fact is uh, invasive species are something that we are constantly, constantly constantly dealing with. And in this case, uh, there is zoonotic uh, 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 diseases because there's a, a, an animal host in addition to it eventually getting to us. And so there's those speculations about bats and pangolins that are the reservoirs of the virus. And then they spread to new genetic material, the new genetic material they spread to being homo sapiens, being humans. So at all right, any rate, so here we'll, we'll talk about uh, I used this when I gave a talk in Lake County. So that's Tim Brosman, one of the greatest nurserymen in Ohio, the greatest guy you'll ever meet. Tom, I can't, I can't pronounce, Brzezuniak, uh, works for Lake Metro Parks. Tom DeHaas, who is our OSU extension agent in Lake County. We're in the woods and we're looking at beech leaf disease, but I bring, I bring this up to introduce our next little segment, which is Tree of Heaven. So this is actually in Sacramento where Tree of Heaven took over this vacant lot. But Tom is doing some nice research projects on Tree of Heaven, which is a native, which is an invasive species in Ohio. So Tree of Heaven, you can kind of see, this is, uh, Lo uh, Lola, do you recognize where this, I took this picture from? This is where I, I took this picture from the Letonia Coke ovens, which yeah. I assure you, if you're in Youngstown, if you have not been to the Letonia Coke ovens, it is one of the most interesting places you will ever visit, this nice little park outside of Letonia. Oh, I agree. But at any rate, they had a lot of invasive species there. And I would, I, we dug this uh, tree of heaven up out of there to show you the root system, uh, this tiny little plant, and then the root system of that plant, really a tough, tough, hardy plant. This is uh, some tree of heavens that have been treated with herbicides. And this was in the uh, Shenandoah National Park. I took a couple of seasons ago. And you know, here you just see the tree of heaven growing everywhere. There's the flowers, there's the fruits, there's a leaf. So remember I said before their leaf may be three or four feet long. Mm -hmm. That is one leaf. And because it all comes from one axillary bud, this is defined as a leaf. There are no axillary buds in here, which means these are leaflets and not leaves. And so that whole thing is one leaf. That's a really cute little insect uh, uh, called the Ilanthus bug. And, uh, but at any rate, that is, uh, so that is tree of heaven. It's become a big issue in our forest. Uh, it is also uh, uh, historically kind of uh, interesting. Uh, oops, I guess I don't have that on there. But it is the tree that grows in Brooklyn. Uh, and this actually is in Brooklyn. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the uh, early 1900s book of a tough plant that grew up between the cracks of a building, 
you can see that it will grow anywhere. So there's a nice little Alanthus. This may have been in uh, uh, this may have been in Akron one day when I was getting a rental car. This is a tree that is growing in Brooklyn. These are trees that are growing in Brooklyn uh, as well. Uh, you know, so and there's that axillary bud, and then coming off of that is a big long leaf with a bunch of little leaflets. There's no axillary bud in between is where those leaflets come in there. So it is a significant invasive. There's always that issue with invasive species. Does it matter? Uh, it grows where other things won't grow. Big deal. And that's always uh, uh, up for discussion. And we'll discuss some of that today. You've got to decide sometimes, is it too late to do anything about it? Are we going to extend massive efforts to deal with it? Let's say that you're talking about your land bank over there in Youngstown, uh, and you have some sites where you have Ilanthus, which you do, by the way, of course. And you say, well, let's get rid of all those plants. And then you say to yourself, well, I mean, it's here. Can we really get rid of all of them? How much energy and resources are we going to exert to try to get rid of them? Uh, are they maybe doing some good along with the fact that they're not native and that are invasive? Are they place, you know, are they getting rid of other native plants? You know, what else are they going to do? Are they going to, you know, invade natural areas? Those are all issues that are not easily answered, which is, again, why I think that it's a wonderful issue for us to talk about because they aren't easy. There are, there are so many nuances, but that's the tree of heaven. That is an example of what many people would consider a bad plant because it's crowding out native plants. So the pervasiveness of invasiveness. You know, I, I, I look at this, you know, there it is, uh, the, the uh, European honeybee. The European honeybee, they're not native to the U.S. Do we consider them invasive or do we not? I mean, are we so concerned about invasives that we want to get rid of all the beehives of European honeybees that are being used by horticultural industry to pollinate their crops? Uh, you know, you got to make some decisions. Lumbricus terrestris, the European earthworm. I always liked that as a story. Ben Steiner was a wonderful professor in the sustainable agriculture program. He started the sustainable agriculture program at Ohio State University and talked about the health of the soil and those kinds of things and not using as many pesticides, those kind of things. And he was once giving a talk in Chicago to a group and extolling the virtues of earthworms and what they do in the soil and processing organic matter and all this kind of stuff. And uh, no question that those things are true, but the audience was very hostile to them. And they said, well, don't you understand that the European earthworm, the, that uh, these night crawlers are not native? Yeah, well, they're not native. He knew that. And they said, and they're causing problems. And he says, well, yeah, but what are you going to do? I mean, at this point, you know, are you going to bioside you know, the, the entire, I mean, basically the well, most of the earthworms east of the Mississippi River are night crawlers, European earthworms, terrest uh, Lumbricus terrestris. He says, do you want to just bioside the whole half of the country? I mean, there's too late. They're here. We can't do anything about it. They're not native, but such is life. You know, so th those kind of issues come into play. So that was kind of my understanding of the issue for a while. And this is what I always love about it, because I, I, you know, I love issues where I keep learning how, that I was ignorant. And so... I mean, you know, it's, it's the nature of science. That's what I, I mean. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a kind of a science educator. And, and, and that's, you know, science is always trying to disprove and, and, you know, understanding our ignorance is so critical. And so at any rate, uh, that was kind of the way I thought about it for a while. And so then when I hear people say, oh, you know, we have problems with the earthworms, I just kind of, you know, filtered out everything they were saying. And said, well, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to buy aside the eastern half of the United States? Blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out that there's other earthworms that are now of significant issue. So there are Asian earthworms in our woodlands that are, are different. Now, again, the issue becomes, what are we going to do about it? I mean, we would advise people not to take pots from their garden, especially of plants that aren't native and then and where the soil may not be. And, you know, put, you know, take those pots out to the woods and throw them in the woods because some of these uh, jumping earthworms are Asian species, not the European earthworm that we see here, they are Asian species that are causing significant damage to the ecosystems of certain forested areas. Tom Bajasnik, uh, John Bajasnik up at Lake Metro Parks kind of introduced me to thinking about some of these issues. And the reality of it is that they so overprocess the soil that they damage the roots of a lot of plants. And so you'll go into a forested area, which should have a good undercover of different plants, different forbs, you know, different and shrubs and everything, and they're kind of barren because they're over-processing of the organic matter, 
which you know earthworms do, but overprocessing it, making it tough for the roots of plants, and so you don't have an understory. So, you know, you constantly learn that what you thought you you know was an enlightened uh, a view of something is not as enlightened as you thought it would be. Here we have Eric Draper, uh, OSU Extension in, in Geauga County, and he's being invasive here, obviously. And it, it's it's interesting to consider. I mean. There aren't many anthropologists that believe, for example, that human life uh, originated in Youngstown. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about that and you kind of believe in the, the Fertile Crescent and, and uh, you know, whatever you, you, you think about where human life basically eventually evolved, it probably wasn't here. And so really we're all invasive. So Eric is in a, a red jade crab apple in the New York Botanic Gardens, but uh, you know, we're all invasive. And so, you know, you always have to keep calling yourself on things. Uh, there's a tomato, of course, tomatoes would, or, you know, and you, you might say, well, and so I could say, well, okay, tomatoes are obviously not native. They're also native to that area in South America. So they're not native to Ohio. Corn is not native to Ohio. Uh, you know, potatoes are not native. Green peppers are not native. The garlics that we eat are not native. The onions that we eat are, you know, it'd be very hard to have a native uh, vegetable garden because almost everything in our vegetable garden is not native. But then you have to decide, well, are they invasive? Do they cause problems? Well, you'd say, well, tomatoes aren't invasive, but here they are growing. They just are growing in the back of a pickup truck that had a lot of debris in it. And so they just, there were seeds in there. So they have the potential to be invasive, but we don't think of it that way. So you always have to go back and forth with these issues. We'll still talk about that sparrow in a minute. This is an interesting case here. This is a picture of thousand canker disease. So canker are these damaged areas in this stem. And this is a little twig of walnut, black walnut. And excuse me, that I shouldn't have done that. And so thousand canker disease is an interesting disease of black walnut. And it's interesting relative to our definition of invasiveness and our understanding of the biology associated with the pervasiveness of invasiveness. So this is a problem that uh, became recognized here uh, in the last you know, 20 and 30 years, not like that long in, in Ohio. But what they started to notice was that black walnuts in Denver and in the Pacific uh, Northwest Black walnuts were dying. They were dying slowly. They weren't like, it wasn't like a situation with emerald ash borer where things happen pretty quickly once the pest got loose. It takes a long time for a plant to, for a walnut, to, a black walnut to die from a thousand canker disease. A thousand canker disease ultimately is caused by an interaction between the walnut twig beetle and a, the geosmithia fungus, which is a tiny little fungus which causes the cankers to actually occur. But it's a very intimate relationship between the uh, walnut twig beetle and the uh, geosmithia fungus. And so here's what was, so they started to notice, uh, Whitney Cranshaw, an entomologist out in, in, in Colorado, was one of the key people. And they started to notice these walnuts were dying. And so that was interesting. And so they finally determined that you had this walnut twig beetle and that they also had this geosmithia fungus were associated and together and causing these cankers. And so then they started to try to piece it together. One thing that Whitney tried to do was to encourage the United States Department of Agriculture uh, to characterize uh, the walnut twig beetle uh, and then the geosmithia fungus, but especially the walnut twig beetle, he was an entomologist, to characterize them as invasive species, which would have allowed for quarantines, which would have allowed for maybe hopefully slowing down this dying of all these black walnuts in these locations. And uh, USDA did not do so. And their argument for not doing so was that the walnut twig beetle is native to the United States and they don't, they don't classify an organism that is native to the United States as being a alien invasive organism. Now there's a lot of reasons that, and so Whitney went, you know, it really angered him, but of course you can argue that, you know, they can only declare so many things invasive. They only have so many funds are going to focus on non-native invasives, but, but that was their decision. 
But here's what's really interesting about it, and it's why it is so interesting to think about the science of invasiveness. I mean, some of, a lot of new people that are really interested in ecology and are really some of our best uh, young minds in, in, in uh, bioscience are really focusing on a lot of invasive species issue because of how interesting they are about revealing uh, biology. And so here's, here's what the deal was. Walnut twig beetle is in fact native. It's native to uh, New Mexico, Arizona, a little bit of California. And it's called a twig beetle because it would only was causing problems on, our, on the native walnuts that are in those area, the California walnut, the, you know, the Arizona walnut. So they were, they were on walnuts, but they were on some of those locally native walnuts that occur in that part of the country. And they caused a little twig dieback. They didn't cause trees to die. They did not cause the thousand canker disease such that walnuts actually were dying. Large, large seemingly healthy trees were dying. And so it was native and it was native in a way that is probably goes back to that when worlds collide aspect and been native and they had been interacting. So the walnut twig beetle, the geosmithia fungus and the native walnut species had been occurring together for long periods of time. And so through natural selection, the survivors progressively were all those that had figured out how to live together, basically, in the sense that the plants that survived were ones that had little tiny mutations that eventually were enough to make it so that it became just something that occurred on already dying plants rather than healthy plants. So it was a native species, but here was the problem. And it's an interesting issue biologically, whether you decide to call it invasiveness from the USDA's point of view or not, biologically they were invasive because here's what happened. Black walnuts are not native to Denver and California and the Pacific Northwest. So the issue of invasiveness was really that we were taking a species that was native to Ohio, let's say. You put that out in Denver where it's not native, and then it comes into contact with a native species of insect, but it has never encountered it before. So from a biological perspective of when worlds collide, when genetic material collides, when you have an organism that has not faced that particular pest, that's when the problem occurred and that's why the black walnuts were dying. So then we started to find it in different locations of the United States and Tennessee in Ohio. Uh, so we had a big infestation, or not a big infestation, a small infestation in Ohio, we think probably associated with uh, pallets and tools and the kinds of things that occur uh, with wood products. And so uh, but, but what an interesting thing. How do we think that uh, it got back to Ohio? The, the, the walnut twig beetle that was then on these non-native walnuts that were out there and non-native in the sense of non-native to Colorado, wood products and wood carvers who brought wood that was infested and brought it back to Ohio. So, you know, it's just kind of, it's always so fascinating how this ends up playing out in nature's infinite book of secrecy, a little I can read. I keep saying that I love that uh, particular quote from Shakespeare. <laughs> this is from a really neat book, <clears throat> uh, Tinkering with Eden. I suppose it's about 20 years old now. Kim Todd wrote this really neat book called, uh, I, I spoke on a program with her once, but, <clears throat> but uh, she really wrote this neat book called the uh, Tinkering with Eden. So here's a few quotes here. And, and, and it, again, this is broadening out our our thought process. And, and by the way, you're looking here at a tamarisk plant, not tamarack, but tamarisk. We'll bring it up again. You're looking at the larvae of the emerald ash borer that causes our problems. You're looking at the Dutch elm disease fungus. By the way, Dutch elm disease, obviously, well, uh, it really isn't so much a matter of the, the, the crazy Dutch that gave it to us. Basically, it's an Asian fungus, which... Uh, was first seen as attacking uh, attacking elms in the Netherlands, and then prob problematically uh, we brought, which had never been exposed to it before, and then we brought those logs over and carried them across the country. And the first time that Dutch elm disease was found in uh, the United States was in Creston, Ohio, here in Wayne County, which is where I am now. I'm ten miles away. The rail yards in Creston, Ohio, where I visited really and looked at the elms that are that are there. It's really kind of neat. 
Uh, and so they called up the Ohio Agricultural Research, the Ohio Ag Experiment Station then in Worcester and out went uh, Paul, Till Paul Tillich and said, oh, that's weird. Because they said, oh, all the trees are dying at the railroad tracks. Can you come out and look what's going on in Ohio State? He goes, I says, well, it's not all the, all the trees. It's just the elm trees. It's just the American elm trees. And he said, oh, then they found out. And he said, uh oh, this is that thing they've been talking about over in Holland and blah, blah, blah. So at any rate, here's a quote from Tinkering with Eden. Some of the most important challenges of our living world involve invasive species, such as the Dutch elm disease fungus, emerald ash borer, and invasive plants. I guess that isn't a quote from Tinkering with Eden. That's my words. But, and we'll hear some quotes from Tinker with Eden in a minute. I'm sorry, I wrote that thing. I could tell because it wasn't very clever. All right, the old world sparrow. This is in Tinkering with Eden. And these are just two, two poems, which I just love these two poems. And it, it reflects the way that we sometimes have such a passion for something really neat and really cool. And it turns out to be not so cool. So this was a uh, quote from, a poem by William Cullen Bryant. We hear the note of a stranger bird that ne'er in the land till now was heard. A winged settler has taken his place with Teutons and men of the Celtic race. He has followed their path to our hemisphere. The old world sparrow is at last is here. And, you know, this is kind of the whole era of time, 1858. You know, they're bringing in, somebody had the idea of bringing in all the birds that are mentioned in Shakespeare and bring those to the new world. It'll be wonderful. You know, that, that whole idea of mixing, oh, this will be great. Kill, kill. And, and believe it or not, it was until, you know, the 19th century, and as we're moving into the middle and to the latter portion of the 19th century, that's really when people first started talking about invasiveness relative to plants, for example. They really, I mean, that wasn't kind of a, 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 people weren't thinking about that. All the early plant explorers, they weren't worried about it all. It was this wonderful thing. Let's bring all these palm trees to Scotland and let's do all this kind of stuff. Well, at any rate, there's this wonderful, oh, we're bringing these birds here. And this is a, a poem that then uh, is also in Tinkering with Eden that she says is anonymous, so they don't know who wrote it, but it's, it's 20 years later. So 20 years after William Cullen Bryant wrote this poem, listen to this other poem, The Old World Nuisance. The poet may sing, and I, all, I have to believe this was the great, great, great grandfather of Dr. Seuss. The poet may sing in the sparrow's praise, but our great ornithologist, Dr. Kuez, says, in language of truth and very plain prose, that the sparrow's a nuisance, and the sooner it goes, the better we're off. So it, to me, it's quite clear that the old world sparrow is not needed here. He defiles our porches, there's no denying that. He has ruined my wife's dress and spoiled my best hat. He hangs round the birdcage to pilfer the seed and gives the canary a foul insect breed. He never eats worms, let us tell it abroad. The old world sparrow is a terrible fraud. That in a capsule tells us the dilemma that we all Yay! face. That was great. <laughs> Isn't that a, just an absolutely wonderful <laughs> juxtaposition? But it tells the story. We get very excited about something new. And, you know, sometimes there's these unanticipated consequences. I mean, what an, an, an incredible. <laughs> so anyway, they read the book. It's great. But, and so she also talks about, for example, in the, you know, again, you get this feeling. Erie Canal Ceremony in 1825, New York Harbor, first barge from Lake Erie to the Atlantic. DeWitt Clinton's grave symbolic rites, the wedding of the waters from the Erie. You know, you can just hear them. The wedding from the Erie to the Atlantic, the Atlantic to the Erie, and vials from, we brought, they bought vials of water from the Thames, the Seine, the Elbe, the Rhine, the Orinoco, the Ganges, the Nile. <laughs> and so they brought these plants in, not even, I mean, you know, we, we undeliberately bring them in, the ballast of ships. That's how zebra mussels end up on the shores of Lake Erie, in the ballast, you know, ships that came in. But, you know, <laughs> Obviously, this wonderful idea, let's combine all the waters of the world. Well, there's some problems with that. And so we have to face those kind of things. So I say these things. What are these species invasive to Ohio? Aliaria petiolata, that's this friend here. So this is garlic mustard brought in as a culinary herb from Europe. And now people think not kindly of it in, in botanic gardens. Lymantria dispar, the gypsy moth. Ophiostoma, which is now ceratocystis, which used to be called ceratocystis. Oh my, that's the Dutch elm disease pathogen. Dracaena polymorpha, that's the uh, zebra mussels. Sternus vulgaris uh, is starlings. And Harmonia axritis, which I always love to talk about this is, uh, does anybody know what Harmonia axritis is? That's the Latin name for the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And again, referring to uh, how ignorant I was and my, our whole group was, our, our extension team went up for a study tour to Canada. 
many years ago, 20 years ago, maybe. And so we went uh, to the University of Guelph Botanic Garden, and there was a wonderful guy there. We loved him. But he seemed like he was a little eccentric. And so he's showing us all this stuff. And then he starts in on these lady beetles that are there. And, you know, he's just going on and on about these lady beetles. They're invasive species from, you know, Asian lady beetles are causing us all kinds of problems. They're really a pain. You know, they're replacing our native lady beetles. And, and we just, you know, come on, you know, you're going a little too far. We understand the idea of invasiveness. This is ridiculous. I think we even wrote an article, which we didn't. Say, but he said, you know, he's a wonderful guy, but my gosh, you know, he's just really too wound up over this idea. Well, and those of us who went through this is we started to notice that uh, multicolored Asian lady beetles, which originally were brought into the United States multiple times to deal with aphids in the pecan orchards in in, uh, in Georgia and, and in fruit orchards out in California. They brought these multicolored Asian lady beetles in. Uh, it, to eat aphids and control these this pest in, in, in orchards. And, you know, quite honestly, uh, they didn't have much of an impact, either positive or negative. I mean, people, they didn't really work effectively to, to limit the aphid populations enough to make a difference as a biological control. And so they kept trying, they kept trying, never really did anything. And then everybody kind of forgot about them for many, many, many years. But in the background, and this is another issue that comes into play with invasive species of all types, it, sometimes you don't see a problem and then eventually it explodes. And so it eventually exploded when we started to notice in the early 2000s in Ohio, for example, <coughs> that these multicolored Asian lady beetles, which were feeding on soybean aphids, were coming into houses. And, you know, we had all kinds of extension programs where we talked about how people needed to uh, how they could clean up these infestations where tens of thousands, there's pictures of hundreds of thousands in people's houses. They came in. In Asia, these multicolored Asian lady beetles would, uh, in the winter, where cold weather came on, they would, they would overwinter in the shadow of rocks in native and natural areas. And so our houses turned out to be these rocks in terms of their, their behavior. And so then they'd come into houses and just massive, massive amounts of them. They smelled if you picked them up and smashed them. Some people put them into vacuum cleaners. And then if they had impeller blades, they'd chop them all up and they would stink like high heaven. I was just a, so, you know, it, it's just an example. And again, they, they caused issues in the Ohio wine production. It, it was like one, one multicolored Asian lady beetle smashed up into like a thousand gallons of wine and, and real aficionados could tell the difference in the taste of the wine. So you get a number of them in there, which, you know, you're stomping around your grapes with your feet or whatever, however you're doing it. The, you get some lady beetles in there when you're make, when you're crushing grapes, if there's a lot of lady beetles out in your grapevines. And so, you know, it, again, who would have thought that? We laughed at that guy. We didn't, we liked him. We didn't laugh at his face, but we thought, oh, come on. You're being a little silly. I've had that happen so many times with invasive species where you don't think it's a big deal. And the other thing that that illustrates is another issue, which is that you really don't know what's going to happen. The, the, uh, the, the Japanese honeysuckle in Europe, there's a great paper in bioscience that talks about the Japanese honeysuckle in Europe, which is brought in as a horticultural plant. And for like 200 years, it was just, oh, this is great. We've got these new honeysuckles. 200 years later, it became a pest. That Japanese honeysuckle is an invasive plant. Something happened. Some tipping point happened that it then started to propagate and do very well. And of course, uh, a, a number of Asian honeysuckles and Eastern European honeysuckles have become real issues in our landscapes. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with their phenology and when they start to leaf out and when they stop leafing out. So they have this, you know, what you, one of the things you'll notice uh, soon is along roadsides, you're going to see these massive amounts along uh, roadsides of this plant that is green, that other things aren't green yet. You're already starting to see that. In addition to the calorie pears, you'll see all these green honey, green leaves, and it's honeysuckles. They, they come out earlier and that means that they have a longer period of photosynthesis. So they, uh, and you know, in, in their native environment, perhaps that wasn't a big advantage or it, it, because there were other plants out at that same time and other plants that, that had that particular phenological uh, uh, biological reality. So they're coming out earlier, they're photosynthesizing more, they get an edge on other plants and they also stay green longer in the fall, meaning more photosynthesis, more food production for the plant. And therefore, they 
outcompete in many cases. So, but I have another story about them and it'll be interesting. What are these species exotic to Ohio? Apis mellifera, the European honeybee that we rely on um, less than we used to as we become more aware of native pollinators, but we still use a lot of the European honeybee because of the nature of the way that it is efficient in its hive development, uh, you know, such that it, we can easily transport it to an area with almond for the production of certain uh, fruits. Lumbricus terrestris, and, and uh, that was my European honey, uh, European earthworm story, but then am am amianthus species, which was that jumping earthworm that is a whole different story. And, you know, the, the, I missed that story because I was so focused on my story that I learned about Lumbricus terrestris. Lycopers conus calum, that is our wonderful little, uh, our wonderful tomato. Uh, Boss taurus, which is our little cow here, cowabunga. Uh, which is not native. I mean, think about what we have that is not native and homo sapiens, which as I say, are not native to Youngstown, Ohio. Now here though, and, and this is what I like about our Powell discussion. This is what I like about biology. This is what I like when talking to master gardeners. This is what I like about science is the fact that everything you learn, you know, kind of the next step, you take it away and say, oh, well, it's not as simple as that. And people say, oh, I want it to be simple. Just give me an answer. Well, it just doesn't work that way. It's not the way the world works. And so this is a really interesting paper in, in uh, nature. Now, nature is uh, a natural history thing. Nature is the most prestigious, arguably, uh, one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. I mean, it's where Watson and Crick uh, published the uh, discovery of uh, the nature of DNA. So uh, this is 2011, and Mark Davis and a whole bunch of other people at a article saying, "Don't judge species on their origin." So what Mark Davis, who was a uh, who, uh, Mark Davis himself, was a uh, a, a, a a um, natural, uh, a uh, wildlife biologist and a, a sustainable, bio you know, he, he really was right in the, the area of conservation biology. So he would be the person that you would most commonly think of somebody who is very, very, very concerned with invasive species. But these people were saying, let's not get carried away here. We are not suggesting that conservationists abandon their efforts to mitigate serious problems caused by some introduced species or that government should stop trying to prevent potentially harmful species from entering their countries. But we urge conservationists and land managers to organize priorities around whether species are producing benefits or harm to biodiversity human health, ecological services, and economies. In other words, it's not all that simple. Nearly two centuries on from the introduction of the concept of nativeness, that's what I was talking about, was developed in, in England uh, almost two centuries ago. It is time for conservationists to focus much more on the functions of species and much less on where they originated. Nativeness is not a sign of evolutionary fitness or of a species having positive effects. There'll be many people that are argued to the death over what he just said. We urge, again, conservationists and land managers to organize priorities around whether species are producing benefits or harm to biodiversity, human health, ecological services, and economies. So here's one of his stories that he's, he illustrates here. So this is a tamarisk. This is a tamarack. So tamarack is another a name for our native larch. So if you go to uh, Kent Bog in Portage County, you'll see these wonderful native tamaracks. That's the southernmost uh, natural population of American larch uh, na naturally growing uh, in Ohio. But th we're talking about a different plant, tamarisk that was brought in. Now, so here's the story. It was brought into the U.S. West from Eurasia and Africa as an ornamental and shade tree for dry sites, tough and dry sites, excellent drought, tolerance, salt tolerance, erosion resistance. But, you know, the tide turned after it was brought in for those purposes. By World War II, it was cited as an alien invader and a water thief in dry riverbed sites. So it was taking water that native plants needed to have. But wildlife conservationists now see many, mean by many, as crucial in human modified riverbed ecosystems. So there's an important point being made here. Sometimes you have to recognize that We've modified the ecosystem. And so now the equation needs to change. And so, in, for example, with tamarisk, 
prefer nesting host of endangered native scout and willow flycatchers. So a native in, uh, bird that is endangered is the preferred nesting host. The, uh, uh, this tamarisk is a preferred nesting host. So ecologically, it is providing a great service. Now you can argue, and people do argue forever, about whether that makes up for the fact of the negative effects of tamarisks in these riverbed situations. And I've been in these riverbed areas uh, uh, where uh, in Utah and other places where it clogs things up and not much else is growing there, that you come around a corner and they're all in there. They look like junipers with the, wisp, uh, with the, uh, the wispy uh, green, uh, uh, green foliage of these plants. And they're beautiful, but and you can see they're beautiful fruits. But so, you know, this isn't this doesn't answer the question, should we still be destroying these? And they really are needing to manage these in some cases. But it's what Mark Davis and these other people are saying is let's not be too, you know, let's let's make sure that we do good ecological studies because that's the whole thing is putting it all together. Bush honeysuckle, all these honeysuckles that we we are, are so concerned about from not only Asia, but from Europe, the Tartaria and the Amara, the Morrow honeysuckles, which can cause this kind of look. Uh, they invade forest edges, low density forests, native natural forest gaps, harvested areas, right of way and fence row invaders. There's the, and there are native honeysuckles, there are non-native honeysuckles, but deciduous shrubs, dense stands. I think this picture, I'm not sure, I think this comes from one of my favorite nature preserves. Uh, in, uh, in Green County, uh, Clifton Gorge, up on the ridge, just unbelievable. I may not be from there. I noticed that it's not. It's from Purdue Forestry, so it looks like that. I, this one wasn't my picture, uh, etc. You know, one of the first plants to green up in spring, one of the last to lose lose leaves and fall. I should not say loose leaves. And so, you know, all these features that you see. So, the honeysuckle story that uh, Mark Davis talks about in his Nature paper. 1960s to 80s, many non-native honeysuckles, suckle, introduced for land reclamation projects and improving bird habitat. By 1980s, non-native honeysuckles were seen as alien invaders and sales were banned in some cases. Recent research where abundant bird species increased in berry producing plants with greater seed dispersal. So, you know, I, oh, no, well, now you're confusing me. It's bad, but then what about this? It increases bird species numbers, it creates greater diversity, seed dispersal. Now, if you talk to Marnie Titchenell, she says, yes, Jim, but, so Marnie is our extension, uh, OSU extension wildlife specialist, said, yes, there's a growing consensus that the fruits that these honeysuckles produce, those nice red or, or orange fruits, are kind of like the McDonald's of food for birds. They provide carbohydrates, but not the needed protein or chemicals that will be useful for them. Yet. So... The debate goes on. It's not like the end of the debate, but there's a lot of different ways to look at things. Okay, so then we come to the genus impatient. I don't know. What time is it? Am I going over? Are you all asleep? What's yeah, going on? Here. What time is it? You're good. It's 8.17. It's 8.17? How long yeah. shall I go? Just roll on. We'll stop you. Yeah. <laughs> That's going. the danger. That's a dangerous thing. I noticed that I didn't because I changed this at the last minute. Some of these things are not where they should be. And so I'm getting, but the genus impatient. So let's go back to those impatience that we looked at, these jewelweeds. There's our, these are our two native species of jewelweed, the pallida. And then I always forget what the Latin, uh, the, uh, what the specific epithet is for this one. And there's our uh, bedding plant impatience. Well, there's our bedding plant impatience. So, so they're in the Balsaminaceae family, the Balsam family. So Impatience wallariana is the common bedding plant in Patience that, that we don't have as much of anymore because of Impatience downy mildew, but it's native to Africa. Impatience hawkeri, the New Guinea Impatience, and then you have you know, Impatience capensis and pallida. These are the two that we have in our woodlands frequently, natives in North America. And then you have hybrids, the Sun Patient series or horticultural hybrids that we see. All right, so... Here I am with uh, Jason Vale and Dan Herms up at the Great Garden Show, which is on Mackinac. Uh, what happened here? Which is on Mackinac Island in Mackinac Island, Mackinac Island, uh, in in uh, north of the bridge. Hello. Hello. What? Oh, I thought I thought somebody was asking something. No. We're here. Okay, so we're up at this program, and, and uh, me and Jason got bored, and so we, uh, or maybe it was me and Dan got bored. 
me and uh, me and Jason. Yeah. So we said, okay, we've heard enough talk. So we went down from this wonderful hotel there and we saw this plant and we said, man, what is this? How beautiful. I mean, they were, they were planted. They were massive plantings of this by the landscape architect was actually was up in the hotel talking about the wonderful stuff he had for his, his landscape. And so we kind of, we spent a long time trying to figure it out and we're looking on our phones and whatnot. We said, you know, it, it kind of looks like a, a jewel weed. And so it turns out that it was a jewel weed. So I would have said at the time it was a precious jewel, but you know, there's a question mark here, but it's just an absolutely beautiful plant. But then we started to look it up or is it, is, is it a precious jewel or is it cubic zirconium? Well, you know, I think you could argue that it is cubic zirconium instead of a precious jewel. Impatiens glandulifera, which is that species of impatiens, this, this, this particular jewel weed, is a large annual plant native to the Himalayas. By a human introduction, it is now present across much of the Northern Hemisphere and is considered an invasive species in the area. Uh, uh, Patients glandulifera is a highly invasive annual species spread rapidly in many parts of Europe and North America after its introduction as an ornamental. I even had quotes of it is our worst uh, invasive that we see. I saw it in, in really wonderful areas in Scotland in the Highlands. And so, you know, it was beautiful. And, you know, you originally, I thought, well, that's just what a fantastic thing it is, a beautiful thing. But, and it is being extensively used there in these gardens. And you can see why, but there is that issue. Is it going to become an invasive species? If it is, does it really matter? All those kind of issues come into play. But then I, that's the, later that summer, maybe it was the next year, uh, we went out to the Denver Botanic Gardens. And I noticed there a bunch of, you know, just blatantly in the Botanic Garden. And that always brings up the issue of, uh, you know, for example, we have, we had tamarisks here at, at Seacrest. Uh, but, but at any rate, here it is. And you can see the, the jewel weed or the touch me not component of it. And a lot of us have that wonderful thrill of you, you pinch that little thing and <clears throat> it explodes its seed, which is why it's called touch me not. But there it is, the jewel weed. And uh, this is Balfourii, another non native. And impatience by cholera, which is another beautiful uh, jewel weed that they had out at, uh, and again, that little explosive seed pod at the Denver Botanic Garden, this beautiful, beautiful gardens. And so they, they have decided that they don't think they're going to be impatience there, but they are non-native, that's for sure. All right. So we have to think about all these issues, proper plant selection and that sort of thing, and probably our, our poster child for all this and of course, we could go on forever. It's a very dangerous thing to ask me to just talk until I'm done. But this is a good story to give you an option when I'm done with it. To say, okay, maybe that's enough. Maybe some questions. So here's Pyrus clariana. So Pyrus clariana, you know, glossy green foliage. Beautiful white flowers flowering right now. Beautiful fall color. Now, the first issue that came into play with this was they break easily in storms. They have bad branch angles. And so they are really prone to breaking in storms. And unless you're a utility arborist that is getting paid to clean these up, this can be a problem uh, in urban forestry. I mean, if you're an urban forester that is in charge of not spending a lot of money to deal with the trees in the city, then this became an issue. So here is part one of the calorie pear story. It's an Asian native brought to you at, by the way, I mean, we always say this because we're in the United States. I mean, our pests go to, to Asia too. So, you know, I mean, it's not like all of these are coming from other places. The fact is that we, and some of them, they're, they're scared to death of the bronze birch borer in Europe and the birch forest of Europe. The uh, eastern tent caterpillar, which we don't think of as much of a pest in most years because it just doesn't tend to get that bad. When it gets into China, it's a terrible problem. So, you know, but in our perspective, an Asian native is brought to the U.S. for genes for resistance to bacterial fire blight disease. So bacterial fire blight is a significant uh, disease, bacterial disease that can really, really bacterial fire blight wiped out the commercial pear industry in Ohio because we just didn't have genetic resistance. So it's a bad problem. So anyway, they said, well, okay, let's see if we can breed some pears, fruiting pears that have the genes for genetic resistance from this Pyrus clariana. Let's see if that works. Is they're less susceptible? They do get bacterial fire blight, but they're less susceptible. So 
that didn't work out. In other words, the breeding experiments just didn't really pan out and end up with a viable plant that had all the characteristics we want, including resistance to bacterial fire blight. But as the USDA looked at their plots, they said, wow, this could be a great street tree. Got white flowers, glossy green foliage, excellent fall color, and almost zero fruits, almost no fruits, almost no fruits. I know you don't believe this, but that was the rationale, almost no fruits. Well, but, you know, so they planted them. They planted them everywhere. And then, you know, horticulture magazine or horticulture manuals that said this is a great plant. It's be a great street tree. It won't produce any fruit. So therefore, no mess. You're really going to love this plant. But because of those branch crotch angles, uh, there were cultivated varieties such as Bradford that, you know, they just broke so often that people said, oh, let's do it. Well, horticultural said, well, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are other cultivars, which are clones of Pyrus clariana that have better crotch angles that don't have that much of a problem. All right, so part two. Cleveland Select Aristocrat replaced Bradford due to less tendency to break in storms. So it's okay, there's a nice horticultural solution. We have still have all those wonderful ornamental characteristics. They still produce hardly any fruits. And so they won't be, be a problem. They won't be invasive species. They won't produce fruits that create a mess, et cetera, et cetera. But another problem emerged. And this is, again, the story of invasive species. It always brings you up short. Over time, more and more fruits were observed. <laughs> On our extension Buckeye Yard and Garden Line call, we talked about this over the years. We said, no, I mean, I remember, you know, 25 years ago, we'd say, what does even the fruit of a calorie pear look like? You know, almost never see them. And, you know, we talk about the fact they have genes for self-incompatibility. So plants have all kinds. <laughs> That, 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 that organize themselves to cross-pollinate and cross-fertilize. They there are all kinds of genetic things that occur. Well, so they have these genes that, uh, that code for that, you know, they just won't produce fruits by, you know, a, a Bradford calorie pair won't breed with a Bradford calorie pair. But, but, but then we started saying, you know, every year, we're starting to see more fruits. We're starting to see more Fruits. We're starting to see more fruits. What's going on? So Teresa Culley was a wonderful professor at the University of Cincinnati. There were other people, but she was the key person. What she unearthed was the fact that, okay, Pyrus Calariana Bradford. Now remember these clones. So in horticulture with trees, especially, most of the, uh, most of what we do is not the breeding necessarily that you might do with flowers and vegetables and stuff where you're crossing different types. You're basically just cloning and you're just seeing something that's different. You have a random mutation, you know, it has a pink flower instead of a white flower. It has better branch structure than other flowers. It has better fall color. And it isn't a matter of breeding. Sometimes it's breeding, but you know, it takes a long time to breed trees. It just takes so long. So oftentimes with, with woody plants, especially, it's basically not so much breeding as it is just selection. We see something that's really cool and then we clone it. We just use asexual propagation. We make identical copies. And so what, so, you know, he added these different clones that had different features like better branch structure. And so, so what we didn't realize was going on was that the cultivars, in addition to having those horticultural features that we wanted, you know, the feature of, of a better branch structure, for example, or better fall color with aristocrat. In addition to that, unfortunately, another difference that, was coupled genetically to that difference was that they didn't have the same element of self incompatibility. So the aristocrat was crossing with Bradford. The Cleveland Select was crossing with Brad Bradford. Calorie pair was and still is has tremendous self incompatibility. I went to this little area in in Confluence, Pennsylvania, where they planted. Bradford after Bradford after Bradford and their street trees years after year, and they don't, still don't have any fruits on them. But when you have all this mix of the, these different cultivars, they were crossing. And so that resulted in the production of, in addition to the flowers, the viable, and then the angry birds spread them everywhere. And then that brings us to where we are right now. So there's what the fruits look like. And that's what we started noticing more and more of these. And that is not a nursery. 75 between uh, Columbus and Cincinnati, 
And those are all volunteer calorie pairs. And if you start looking around right now, uh, this is what you don't necessarily notice these as much when they're not blooming. They're just something that's growing over there. But you notice how many white flowers. I mean, there may be a couple of cherries out there somewhere. And in another couple of weeks, there'll be crab apples. But, but right now, what you're seeing is all these calorie pairs everywhere. And you'll notice that now maybe a couple of those were in this apartment complex somewhere. But then you'll notice that there's just massive numbers of them that have spread out from that location. So, so that then results in situations where you actually get people trying to do something about it. And this was very contentious. I mean, there were people in the nursery industry, for example, that you know, had you know, 50,000 calorie pears in their nursery that they have been growing and they're about a year away from being able to sell them. And suddenly uh, the invasive plant council that works with the Ohio Department of Agriculture says, ah, we are thinking to put this on the invasive species list, this calorie pear. But wait a minute, you know, so they gave them a little time. So, and so in January 7th, 2018, so as you can see, three years ago, under new rules that went into effect, the sale and distribution of 38 destructive invasive plant species will become illegal. So this is always a dynamic that's going on. People are arguing, is this really an invasive? Does it really matter? Is it too late? How big of a deal is this? What is going to be the economic impact? And in its list, the state agriculture department included various types of honeysuckles, calorie pear trees, <coughs> autumn olives, fig buttercup, et etc. So two more years of it, and you're not going to be able to produce in a nursery if you're a licensed nursery stock producer in the state of Ohio, and each state is different, of course, and you're not going to be able to sell in a garden center, and you're not as a landscaper that has a nursery stock marketing, uh, a nursery stock license, which many landscapers do, you're not going to be able to put calorie pairs out there. Now, many people would say, well, look, man, it's just too late. I'll never forget Dave... Uh, Dave Gorek, who used to be uh, your Mahoning County Extension agent, uh, who now works for Davy Resource Group and in their group that, that works on wetland or mitigation and stuff like that. And he's been involved in a lot of projects. And one of them was removing all the calorie pairs from Dolls Arboretum down in Newark. And he, he sent me this excited text. He says, Jim, we've just destroyed the last calorie pair at Dolls Arboretum. So they had a big, you know, kill the pear day, a uh, week, month program. And, uh, but of course, you know, an argument could be made, look, you didn't kill the last calorie pair. There's gonna be millions in the seed bank. You're gonna still have them. You're gonna have to keep doing this forever. And you know, that's just one location. So, you know, some people will argue, look, it's too late. There's too many of them. There's billions of them in the state of Ohio. Maybe you don't like them. And eventually they will equilibrate. Everything eventually settles into the ecology locally. Of course, it may take hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years, which is not something we're willing to live with. but but you know, there's all these arguments, but the argument right now has been one that that is considered an invasive species and it's got two more years before that's gonna move out of the, the realm of at least new ones being planted. So it's just a fascinating uh, scenario. I mean, one of the early ones that, that I thought was crazy was somebody had just planted a bunch of calorie pears at Miami University. And this is uh, 15 years ago, maybe. Uh, and uh, you know, somebody, pointed out and said, you know, hey, this is a problem. You know, you're going to have trouble with this because they shouldn't be planted. You know, the biologist or it was a person in the, one of the departments or this is a biology department says you shouldn't have planted them. and they cut them down. Well, you know, so, you know, and we thought, oh, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in the way. But, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, it, I mean, it, it turns out that you got to remember this kind of look. This, this is an incredible invasive species. Now, again, you know, can you do anything about it? Oops, something weird happened. All right, so uh, here is the Ohio Nurserymen's Association, which eventually came around to thinking about this invasive plant. And so uh, Andy Dozberg, who was the president at that time of the Ohio Nurserymen and Landscape Association, we're embracing this. I can't argue with it. I've seen the impact. We wanna be good stewards of the environment. We want to do right. So, you know, that's it. it change does occur. <laughs> but my final coda to this. <laughs> 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 and we all know about 9-11. We know the Freedom Tower that's now there. And, uh, you know, you, you, look, you look at uh, the, uh, oh, what's this called? The, 
the Fe not the Phoenix, the, well, I've forgotten. But at any rate, there's the beautiful uh, things that have been created at the site of where the Twin Towers were. And so the, the new thing. Well, you look down here now at the, the Freedom Tower, the, the replacement for the Twin Towers, and you look at this tree here and you see, what is this tree? Well, this is a cutting from the survivor tree. <laughs> so, you know, when the Twin Towers fell, there was this tree that survived uh, in, you know, in the church across from uh, the Twin Towers. And this one tree with, you know, all this debris was around it and everything was smashed and destroyed. And there was this one tree, the survivor tree. And so then they took that tree and they took it to a nursery and they propagated from it in upstate New York. And then they brought it, brought it back and they planted it in the plaza there. And they've sent these trees to every state of the union as a, an example of the, the survivorship and the great toughness of this particular tree. And guess what? It's a calorie pear after all this effort. Oh, no. And again, I, I, I point it out simply because of how fascinating issue constantly is. so uh, it must be after 8 30 you're probably all interested uh you know we actually when we talked to china this morning we went from eight to noon which in china uh, in Nanjing, which is where they were all connecting from for them it was midnight so we finally let them go to sleep at uh, about midnight uh in china when we were done at noon it was a little bit more so it, but we're not to midnight but are you about done have you had enough no, we can actually go ahead and you know stop here and stuff because I want to give Tom a chance to ask a question. I know he had one yeah, last no, time that we talked and stuff. So let's okay. bring him. Let's I bring promise him. I won't go any more longer in the answer and beyond midnight. Thank you, Jim. Tom, do you want to go unmute and ask your question? Okay. Well, I have a question. Ahead, um, I missed I missed the garlic um, mustard thing. Well, you're a very lucky person. <laughs> Was it long? No, I mean I no, I didn't I didn't really get it. I mean I have. A is whole it thing. a big? Is it a biggie? Well, let me answer that in two questions. Uh, I didn't really. Uh, I, I think I have garlic mustard later. I'm not sure if I did include that this time or not, but. Uh, garlic mustard, you know, one of, some people would say that garlic, uh, let's see if it's in there. I, I probably have weeded that out of this. You had thing. a picture of it, and that's yeah, the I asked it. the question. I thought I missed what you said. No, I just brought it up. I'm, so I'm the thing is that we have it in Poland forest, and we're going crazy to try to get it out of there. And because yeah. it's, we feel that it's squeezing out the native things. But what do you think? Well, the, the, uh, the good news, I guess I didn't include it any more about it in this present. I think I just included it in this presentation just because it's something that people are familiar with. That's so I okay. guess I would say several things about garlic mustard. The first thing I would say is that uh, it's really easy to remove. So that's kind of nice. I mean, you try to get rid of, uh, of, of, of honeysuckles. Uh, from a wooded area. I mean, it is a major, major thing. I mean, you might as well bring in backhoes. I mean, it's, re or, you know, or you could bring in chiropractors for the people that right. are trying to do it with your back. The, so, so it's easy to pull out. Here's the thing. There are biennials. So a biennial is a plant that produces, uh, you know, a, a biennial is a plant that uh, produces only vegetative growth in its first season from seed. And then the second season, it produces flowers. So number one, and, and, and one of the, uh, the things you have to be aware of is in that first season, it's kind of these basal rosettes. I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd show you the pictures, but I'd have to spend a lot of time oh, trying to presentations in. But, but so you, you, they're basal rosettes. They don't look like, that picture of garlic mustard that I had here was, uh, was- uh, up, Jim. What's that? It was the flower. It up. It was back. Yeah. So the uh, when you see garlic mustard, uh... well, we I'm familiar with the flower because we. All right. So, so the first year of garlic mustard, the leaves won't even look like this. Not only are there no there are no flowers in that first year, the leaves aren't these wedge shaped uh, triangular leaves. The oh, leaves, okay. are basal rosettes. 
they're little uh, kidney shaped uh, leaves. And so you may not even know they're garlic mustard. Uh, you won't see the flowers in that first year after seeding. So one of the things you'll need to do is, and just look it up on Google or something like that, and just say right. basil of your garlic mustard. And it'll show you what the leaves look like because that's when you want to get them. Uh, you want to get them in that first year so that they won't even make it to the second year. Because what happens if you, you can't, you certainly can't wait till here. There's been all kinds of research that shows that, that, you know, if you pull these out of the ground, which you can still do fairly easily and lay them there, those seeds are still going to be expelled. Even if, even if they haven't already been expelled, even after you pull them out of the ground, they will, those seeds, those massive numbers of seeds will be spread from that just laying on the ground. So you can't just pull them out. You have to get them out of there. Yeah, uh, well, from people, what, what everyone's told to do in Poland Forest is put them in a plastic bag and throw yeah. them in the trash. So they've got that part of the puzzle down. But what you yeah. want to do, if you can do it, is get them out of there in year one. So learn what they look like with their little basil rosette leaves. and okay. get. Now, you're going to have a mixture, of course, uh, if, you're, if you're even thinking that there's a problem, that means they've been there for a while. So you're going to have a mix of, you know, at any given time, you're going to have a mixture of first year and second year garlic mustards. So while you're getting rid of these, hopefully before they, and believe me, this happens quickly. So when you see these wedge shapes, but they haven't produced flowers yet, get them, you know, that's when you want to schedule your, your day to get them out of there is before this happens. Uh, and while you're doing that on these second year where they're reproducing and then they're going to die after producing seed, uh, you want to also get rid of the, the first year rosette leaves uh, to nip that in the bud. So, so, you're, so one thing you need to do is get an identification scheme as part of your plan so that when okay. you're of the garlic mustard, hopefully before this has happened, when you're doing that, you also get rid of the first year because then that's going to help you the next year with those that were starting to come up. It's doable. Uh, the only you. thing about it is if you don't do it, at least one thing about garlic mustard is, and Dan Herms always makes a point about this, is they're somewhat of ephemeral. I mean, it's not like they're going to be with you all season. As you probably noticed, they die back in whenever, June, July. So at least you don't, I mean, unfortunately, they're going to be more of them every year if you don't do anything about it. But but, uh, you know, they don't last through the whole season, I guess, is all I can say, which is maybe a uh, small comfort. But uh, and, and, you know, of course, the, the thing to do is to uh, collect them and uh, take a portion of them out of there and make pesto. They make good pesto. <laughs> garlic. Oh, good to know. So, you know, garlic. So one of the things a lot of people do in garlic mustard uh, digs or poles uh, is, uh, you know, have a feast afterwards uh, because you can really make pretty good pesto. From, I mean, that's why they were brought over as a, as a whole herb. And so they, they'll, they'll be a good uh, little good little mustard type uh, herb, <laughs> or a, an edible herb. So, Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay, if anyone else has any questions, please unmute your mic and go ahead and ask Jim. We'll take a couple more before we end our session here. Okay, Hello. just can I ask a question? Just Go one ahead, question, Diane. real fast. Um, so, especially with the pear tree or the whatever it's called, the calorie pe calorie uh, uh -huh. pear tree. Okay, so though it was considered an invasive simply because it could create fruit and could cross breed with trees, other trees. Is that why it was considered an invasive? And well, it did it so quickly and, and could multiply so quickly what? Who did it hurt? Okay. So uh, it, it doesn't cross with other, other types of trees. It's just that the different cultivars, the different clones of Pyrus clariana uh, cross with each other. Okay. And so it's not crossing with germplasm of other species. It's just right. they, and so they replace other, they replace native trees. They replace native trees. Okay. I mean, the whole, the whole concern that people have with, invasive species is that there are species that are not adapted and that they're not here in our native landscape. So, you know, obviously the biggest concern would be somebody that has a natural area. And suddenly you have a natural area that now a wetland that is now clogged up with thousands of calorie pear trees. Or maybe you had a wildflower area in that, that area that we showed the, 
the, the calorie pairs that you know that that uh, uh, that uh, now have there's nothing but calorie pairs there. there I mean there there have been uh, estimates of certain areas of calorie pairs uh, in fields that are there's over half to a half a million to a million calorie pair seedlings there. So okay. they're replacing native vegetation. And in addition to replacing native vegetation, that of course then changes the ecosystem, changes the interactions of all the different organisms okay. occurring together. So, so but you that, that, that way, therefore it's negative. But what if it blended into the system and was helpful to the ecosystem? Would it See, not? I have, a, I have an interesting, I have an interesting, uh, example for that so you you segued into one little small thing it won't be too long we'll, uh, uh let's see what about okay. so so let me just phrase it this way so we have this program at ohio state called why trees matter and it's about the environmental benefits of trees so for example on the osu campus in columbus we've done this eye tree analysis that has been developed that shows the annual ecological benefits of trees. So it's a it's a it's a, a model that shows on you know how a tree of a particular species and a particular canopy type, what it can do at a given size. So a 27 inch Oriental oak, in this case a non-native oak, but stormwater mitigation, $82 worth of stormwater mitigation benefits from that tree, reduced atmospheric carbon, you know, that's kind of the carbon sequestration, energy, heating, cooling if it's next to a building air quality value, aesthetic history. And you can, so you can look at all those benefits. So trees have benefits, okay. And that's the iTree program. It's a wonderful thing. Go to treebenefits.com sometime. It's a wonderful way to get a feel for the benefits that trees could provide. All right, so now let's go to a, a program that uh, Chris Riley, who is a graduate student, he's now uh, Dr. Riley. So Chris was a uh, graduate student of, uh, of uh, Mary Gardner at Ohio State University. She got a huge grant to study uh, vacant lots and to look for beneficial insects. So her basically original project was to check for, okay, we got all these vacant lots in Cleveland, for example, you know, what is, you know, what's, what's on these lots? The vegetation, but also what kind of insects are there and spiders and, you know, all kinds of things that have beneficial aspects in the landscape controlling to all this stuff. So, so the question then became, she's, she's doing all this with Chris, and they finally uh, had a meeting with, uh, with Chris and, and Mary and me, and, and especially Dan Herms, and, and we started talking about this eye tree concept, this idea of the benefits that trees provide in urban parks, forest fragments, street trees, residential properties, vacant lots. What about the trees on vacant lots? And so Chris called me up one day. So we started thinking about the hmm. Okay, here are these trees, and what are these trees? Well, it turns out that over half of them are invasive species, or half of them are non-native species. Instead of American elms, they'd be Siberian elms. There's lots of calorie pears. Uh, there's lots of Norway maples. There's a lot of non-native trees that are considered invasives, at least by certain people, in these vacant lots, because what the only thing that's growing there is whatever happened to start growing there after they became vacant. Vacant land. So then the question becomes, well, okay, it's your question, basically, that you're asking. Okay, there's the negatives that we can we can ascertain for, from invasives. What about the positives? And this this infuriates Kathy Smith. So I work with Kathy Smith, who's a, a forester for Ohio State University, and she doesn't want me to say anything positive about invasive species. And I'm not really encouraging invasiveness, mm -hmm. but this study is really interesting. So there's Mary. And there's Chris. And one of the things Chris asked me to do is that I, I can't figure out what these elms are. Are they Siberian elms? Or are they American elms? Are they rock elms? What are they? Well, it turns out that not only are they all those things, but they're also hybrids between the Siberian you know, elms. So they're hybridizing. So we go up and we look at a lot of these plots. And you can see the kinds of vegetation that develops on these lots. And some of them are trees. All right. So exotic trees contribute to urban forestry diversity, forest diversity and ecosystem services in inner city Cleveland, Ohio. So here's one of the papers that they wrote, Chris Riley, Dan Herms, Mary Gardner. And you look at the native trees and the exotic trees, the exotic trees that are at least non-native and usually considered invasive. So that we're talking here about the Siberian elms. We're talking and, and look at what you have, tree abundance. They're mostly, they're more non-natives than there are natives. 
in these vacant lots and there's even more of these trees and there's so there's a tremendous amount of trees in these vacant lots and in all three of these cases the residential the the, the small residential the commercial residential the big they're you know it's they're the invasive trees and so we decided okay so look at the i not me i didn't i was just a peripheral part of this but I tree echo, which is one of the ways that I tree looks at the benefits trees provide, estimates the output of ecosystem services generated by a hectare of urban forest land found on each property type in Cleveland, Ohio. So this is just the number of vacant land. So it's not as the, the, the amount is not unbelievable. But but you look at this and you recognize that in inner city vacant lots, there's a pretty good amount of things like carbon storage and sequestration and oxygen production. So, so there's the answer to your question. Invasive species, though you can look at the negatives, invasive species actually produce a positive. They're, they're doing these ecosystem services. If you're talking about stormwater remediation, if you're talking about carbon sequestration, if you're talking about air quality improvement, if you're talking about energy improvement, all of those things are done by invasive non-native trees as well as native trees, which again is, is the, the fundamental theme of what we've been talking about here is there's a lot of ways to cut this. There's a lot of ways to look at this. So in other words, if you said, well, we're gonna get rid of all the native tree, the non-native trees on these vacant lots, we got a grant and we're gonna spend millions of dollars. No, no. Well, we spend our resources to do that, but we're also gonna actually be causing a detriment. I mean, this is an argument you could make. Now you could also argue, we just don't want these to be spreading seed to our natural areas in the Cleveland area. But, but the other argument would be, look, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot to cut off your face or that is now it goes, whatever. The point is, <laughs> you, you, the, the point is that, that invasive species are just as it goes all the way back to Mark Davis in that article in Nature. It's, they're not this wild hair, evil, monolithically evil thing. What if, what if their environmental services, what if their role ecologically is more positive than negative. Those are important considerations and discussions. And oftentimes people do not want to hear it. They want it to be black and white, good, bad. It's never that way. Okay. All right. Thank you. You've answered my question. And, I, and yes, and I was very, very happy when, when the, when the um, judgment began to change just a little bit in favor of, of uh, non-native, simply because I, I, think the planet is totally I don't know I, I don't know where the natives are you know I think that I don't know I think given the chance everybody would be a non-native at some time in their life and vice yeah. versa yeah, that's right well you know uh, just my final thing Lola, uh, Lola. Go ahead. The, uh, this will just be a brief thing and you know she knows that I lie but that's the you way guess. it is I mean I'm a plant pathologist and therefore I'm also a pathological liar it's just the way this it goes is true. this is true but, uh, the Connor blue but the Connor blue butterfly. So it's an endangered species, the darling of uh, you know all endangered species uh, insects, and, and beautiful butterfly. Tremendous loss of the Connor blue butterfly by habitat destruction. So there's a really interesting book about the Connor blue butterfly that, and and it really asks the question ultimately that okay the the original. Uh, natural area for the Connor blue butterfly, which included a tremendous amount of, of, along the, uh, of the oak, the oak, uh, not the oak barrens, the oak uh, openings uh, near Toledo and all the way across into the Indiana dune area and that kind of area. That's where a lot of Connor blue butterflies and they need a blue lupin. So one of the things that the Connor blue butterflies, they need to feed on blue lupins. And so, you know, they estimated, you know, the pre-European colonization, how much of that habitat was there. And then they uh, then they they looked at that particular habitat, which you know now includes a few carnivore butterflies because they are endangered species, and there's only a few areas where there are, are are places where they will grow and where people will plant lupins so that there'll be habitats for carnivore butterflies. And you know they said, well, okay, so how much would it take to because you know you might say, well, let's return this area for the carnivore blue butterfly. Let's return it to the habitat that they once had. And so somebody actually did the work and, and you know, it's you know, 
10 times the annual uh, gross national product of the United States to return the habitat for this one butterfly to what it once was. Now that's not to say, okay, so the heck with the invasive spe or the endangered species list, the heck with doing things that could allow for there to be areas that harbor carnivore blue butterflies, but it's taking the argument to a, a, an area which is not just, let's just, you know, it, it's irrational to say, let's return the habitat of that portion of North America to where carnivore blue butterflies could live like they once lived. Uh, it's not practical. Uh, it's not the environment that's there anymore, any more than our backyards and our urban sites. You know, I always said this about our tree, uh, tree campus. You know, we have a, uh, Lola leads a, a group that developing tr a tree campus USA sites. Now, I'll always remember in our tree campus, uh, OSU campus in Columbus, we have one in Worcester too. And of course, they're all throughout Northeast Ohio because of Lola. But in the tree campus, uh, OSU Columbus, one day we were, the, the, the lamenting was going on and we all shared in it of the removal of certain sycamores from the campus. And so, uh, and it was, a, you know, it was kind of a crazy thing that they were doing for a temporary road. They were gonna take these sycamores out that have been there uh, anchoring the underground railroad sites and all this, and there's no reason that those, I mean, we didn't see a sufficient reason for getting rid of those sycamores for that temporary road. But the comment came up and this is always what you have to balance. The comment came up was, we need to create a policy in which there will never be another tree taken off the OSU campus. And so we're sitting in this meeting room in Howlett Hall, the horticulture building in Columbus. And so somebody said, some irritating large person, me. <laughs> well, we're sitting in a building, right? What do you think? Do you think there were trees where this building is? I mean, the fact is you do have to balance things out. I mean, we're all irritated when we take away natural areas, when we take away a tree, but to, to go to, the, and you know, my real point was nobody is gonna listen to us on campus. Nobody will listen to us if our argument is you cannot remove any more trees. I mean, you can't make that argument. I mean, that's an argument that, you know, unless you decide the, you know, the, to go the radical perspective and kill all the moderates and all that kind of stuff, the reality of it, that goes way too far because nobody's going to accept or agree to that because it is irrational. You can't, you're in a building that once was trees. So now it's not. And there you are talking. Well, you know. Well, so Jim, anyway. This has been a very good session. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Unless anyone has a dying question, we're going to go ahead on end it for tonight. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, Jim, before you go, we definitely want to see if you'll put us on your calendar for sub sub September 9th. Okay. Yeah, let me check it out. All right, I appreciate it. Let me look. I still have a calendar. Let me just do it right now. Right. You know, While you're looking at stuff, we're actually going to have Dr. Daniel, aka Dan Herms, who will be presenting for us next month on oh, May the 13th. And his focus is going to be what's emerging in the climate change. Uh, he's very, very knowledgeable. So if you have someone that is interested in that topic, please, when you get the link and stuff from Diana, share it with them. And it's going to be a very wonderful opportunity to meet with somebody who's actually been doing an extensive amount of research in that area and stuff. He's with the day. Yep. No, yeah, you, you will just absolutely go agog with Dan Herms. He is the he is the a transformational thinker. Yes. OK, so Jan, so September 9th is cool because September 10th, September 10th is our whatever I'm calling it now, the 91st Ohio Plant Diagnostic Workshop. Right. So we have this diagnostic workshop, which we feel like we're going to be able to do in person in Worcester. It's on the 10th. OK, so what you gotta do. Yep. So what you got to do is if you want to come to that, you know, come over here, stay over the overnight in, in Worcester and we'll go to dinner after we've got a dinner at, it's at City Square somewhere after dinner, after we do our Kung Pao program. And uh, and we could even go to Basil and we could have Kung Pao shrimp or whatever. And and then uh, you would be there for an all day di plant diagnostic workshop the next day, which is such a gas. So at, so it's, I, I got September 9th down. I'm glad to do it. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim, so much as always. You are awesome. You're a great presenter. We love having you. Love having right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Okay, Bye -bye. I'm I'm going to leave the session.
Uh, Lola, okay, yes. you can do that. Doesn't matter. Okay, I got it. Got so, it. All right, all take right. care, everyone. Be safe. Yeah, see y'all.